Hey there, welcome back to another review, this time of the 1980 sci-fi horror flick Altered States. In the basement of a medical school, Dr. Jessup floats in total darkness. The most terrifying experiment in the history of science is out of control, and the subject is himself. <laughs> anyway, uh, welcome to my review of Altered States. I've reviewed this film before, but I wanted to do it again because I really like this movie. This is a film that, after like the third or fourth viewing, I've learned to appreciate even more than I did before. It's one of the most visually stunning and impressive films I've ever seen. It really does have some amazing visuals that, just by themselves, I could watch all day. And they should be put on a canvas somewhere in an art gallery. Like, that's how effective and how gorgeous and how visually stunning and spectacular the visuals are in this movie and when I read up some more about the film uh, when I figured out some stuff about the making of it it surprised me even more because this film had a very troubled production this is a movie that started out in the conceptual phase in the late 70s around 1978 and it was originally funded by Columbia Pictures and actually, there was footage that was actually shot, there were effects that were worked on by Dick Smith, and there was actually a di completely different director. Uh, director Arthur Hiller uh, was working on Altered States from the beginning, with, uh, at the beginning, you know, the, of the film's uh, conception, and when it was uh, under Columbia Pictures, Arthur Hiller was directing it uh, with visual effects by... I believe it was John Dykstra, and I, I think it, I think it's either John Dykstra or it's um yeah John Dykstra. It's John Dykstra. John Dykstra is working on the film with Arthur Hiller and Dick Smith, who would go on to do the effects for the ultimate the version of Alter States that we got that was actually finished. Also worked on effects for the other version of the film that was being directed by Arthur, Hill Arthur Hiller featuring visual effects by John Dykstra. Well, Arthur Hiller's idea of uh, makeup effects and visual effects was a lot different than what Ken Russell's idea would be and a lot different than what Warner Brothers would want uh, Aldrich States' visual effects to be as well. So it's very interesting to read this sort of backstory, and I found this out through an article in Fangoria, uh, specifically issue number, I think it's issue number 10 or 11, where it's called I Create the Body Cosmic, and it's written by Ed Naha, and it features interviews with Dick Smith, who talks about the production of the other version of Altered States, and also talks about the production of Ken Russell's Altered States, Warner Brothers' Altered States. Well, what happened was, uh, Arthur Hiller's version of Altered States was so complex, and he wanted to do so many different kinds of complicated effect shots, that it just ended up eating up the budget. And Columbia, basic, they ended up dropping the film. We can't afford it. Columbia's like, we cannot afford this, this has gotten out of control. So, John Dykstra quit, uh, Arthur Hiller, of course, quit. he wasn't involved with the film anymore because the project was pretty much canned, and then Warner Brothers came along and uh, became the new uh, distributor and uh, helped uh, get the film actually made, uh, because the, the producers of the film, um, Howard Gottfried, the producer of the film, Howard Gottfried, he really wanted to get the film made, and so we actually got uh, some uh, work from Dick Smith and basically used that as a selling tool to get Warner Brothers to buy the rights to the film and to eventually fund it and get it released, and the rest is history. 
Warner Brothers accepted the deal, and uh, they ended up not rehiring Arthur Hiller. They went with a different director. They went with Ken Russell, who honestly wasn't even the first choice. He was like way down the list of choices for directors, but they were in a time crunch. They so they didn't really have anyone else who was willing to do it, and I could see why because it's such a, a a daunting task to adapt such a movie like this on screen. And Ken Russell took it. And I think Ken Russell did a, a, a fantastic job directing this movie. I know some, I know, I know Patty Chavesky disagrees, but Ken Russell pretty much did what he could. There was a contract, uh, there was something written in the contract where no one can mess with the screenplay. The screenplay cannot be adapted, it cannot be changed around, because Patty Chavesky was going to sue. So... That frustrated Ken Russell, of course it frustrated Warner Brothers, but they basically just ended up dealing with it. And it ended up working out because there are some really great lines of dialogue in this movie that are definitely attributed to Patty Chavesky. And I, I he, he sued later anyway because he wanted his name taken off the film, but eventually he kept it on. Like So there's a really interesting uh, behind-the-scenes backstory uh, uh, when it comes to the making of this movie, which is why I don't understand why it, when this DVD came out, there was nothing on it, no features. It just had five theatrical trailers, which isn't really five. It's, it's a, it's a misprint. There's, there are not five theatrical trailers. There's two TV spots and there's like a few trailers and that's cool. But honestly, I think this deserves a special edition Blu-ray and it was released on Blu-ray, but it had no features on it. So, but there is a book I heard, though, that talks about the making of the film. And so I'm definitely going to look into picking that up sometime. It's amazing that this film turned out as well as it did, considering how much of a troubled production it has. So it started out as a film with a completely different uh, production studio, and then, and then it ended up being canned, and then it went to Warner Brothers, and then... It had a diff completely different director, and it was just the only constant is Dick Smith, because I don't think uh, Arthur Hiller's film had actually gone to uh, any, it basically was doing effects shots, it was working on effects work, hadn't really shot any other sequences, I don't think, I don't think it had any, I don't think William Hurt was cast, I don't think any of the same cast was there, I could be wrong though, because my, I don't really know that much about the Arthur Hiller version of Altered States, so... But from what I'm hearing from Dick Smith and some other people I've heard, you know, read from on the internet and, and a few articles is that there was a good amount of footage shot. So it's kind of like, where is that footage? Like, what happened to that version of Older States and what would that version be like? How much different would it be than the version that we got? But anyway, the version that we did get uh, is directed by Ken Russell. It's uh, written by Cindy Aaron uh, and Patty Javesky. It stars William Hurt in his acting debut. And when I learned that, my jaw dropped. Because I'm like, this was his first acting role? Really? Like, this is a, a spec an amazing performance. A really, really great performance by William Hurt. And it's his first acting role. It makes his acting in this movie even more impressive because this is the first time he ever acted in a film. I mean, he knocked it out of the park and then some. I think he was robbed of an Oscar nomination. That's how good I personally feel his performance in this movie is. You also have Blair Brown, who uh, plays Emily Jessup. So William Hurt plays Dr. Edward Jessup. Blair Brown plays Emily. And I think Blair Brown did a good job as well. But I think there was just kind of a disconnect between between her and William Hurt. And I think that's due to the screenplay. The screenplay is so analytical and so deep and so thoughtful and so much so written kind of like a play at times that I, I, I don't really I didn't really feel a connection, a genuine connection between Blair Brown and, and uh, William Hurt. And that's a, a big thing. And I still really like the film, but when the movie gets to its climax, when it gets to the end, and it's supposed to have this whole thing where her love for Eddie saves him from the brink, you know, saves him from the abyss, so to speak. 
I kind of didn't necessarily buy it because I didn't really buy the connection. There wasn't enough that we saw on screen that that really made me believe that these two people really loved each other. I saw sort of the drama that Blair Brown loves him, but I didn't really see the, the thing from Eddie that, that Ed Edward loved her. And I think maybe that might have to do with the editing or the screenplay. There just wasn't a lot of moments where we really saw that these two were madly in love with each other. There was a few elements here and there, but it just seemed like an afterthought. Uh, when you compare the love story in this to a film that also deals with transformation and body horror, uh, David Cronenberg's The Fly, it, you just see such a complete contrast. Uh, Cronenberg's The Fly has one of the most powerful and memorable love stories I've ever seen. This, it, it's not really there. It's not on the same level, and I think that would have helped the film a lot. I still really like Altered States, but what prevents it from being a, a great film, a five-star flick, is that emotional connection with the characters. Because I don't really have that. I, I feel that the, the film is really lacking that. And I think a large part is due to the screenplay. Because these characters are written in a way that I personally cannot really relate to. And even though Seth Rundle was a very scientific, analytical man... There was still a side of him that was human that you could relate to. I didn't really feel that with with William Hurt. He was almost robotic in the way that he, he was thinking and the way that he he acted and things like that. He just and it it was a great performance because that's what he was asked to do. And I did believe that William Hurt was this very intelligent genius. And I think that's the whole point is that this is this man is so smart and so intelligent that he just he seems inhuman because he's just so uh, in tune with, you know, his brain and with, you know, with analysis and things like that, that he seems very distant from anyone else, including the woman that he loves. And I, I guess I, that's the point. That's the whole point of the film is trying to establish this fact that. William Hurt's character, Edward Jessup, needs to really understand the true uh, importance of humanity and the true importance of being with, you know, the one, the woman that he loves. But there isn't enough that happens before that that really makes that dynamic work. So when you have this whole thing where he needs to, he need you, you really the whole basically kind of the film hinges on this. The film hinges on this ability for Dr. Jessup to embrace his humanity. And uh, it it just doesn't really it doesn't really get there for me personally. Um he says things that are just are very profound and really do uh, make me think that that's what the film is going for. But with its actions, I don't see it. In this instance, I really think actions would have speak louder, would have spoken louder than words. I'm not saying there aren't any moments where Blair Brown and uh, William Hurt do have you know tender moments with each other. But even in the in the the love scene they have, it's very very disturbing and weird, and it doesn't really seem like that there's really a genuine connection between the two. They're just making love, and he had this weird music in the background, and he's hallucinating. And it's just just one of the. It's really, I don't know. I it, it's a it's a love story. It's a dynamic. It's a relationship that doesn't really seem very solid to me when it comes to what I see on film. You also have Bob Bal Balaban, who plays Arthur Rosenberg, who's a friend of Edward Jessup's, a scientist friend. You have Charles Hayde, who plays Mason Parrish. I love Charles Hayde. He's hilarious. He, t he, he says it like it is. Um, he's a guy who just doesn't take any shit. Um, he was probably the most relatable character out of the entire movie. Uh, you also have Thio Pengulis as Eduardo Echevria, uh, Drew Barrymore in her acting debut as well as Margaret Jessup, their uh, Edward and Emily's daughter. 
And uh, that's pretty much about it. I mean, you have a few other actors and actresses, including John Larroquette, a very young John Larroquette who plays an x-ray technician. Um, and you have George Gaines from Police Academy who plays a doctor who looks at the x-rays of Jessup and then has a very fun line where he's all like, he looks at the x-rays, he's like, peculiar? This man's a fucking gorilla. <laughs> this is a fucking gorilla. <laughs> Just how nonchalant he said, fucking gorilla. This man, he's a fucking gorilla. I, I, I cracked up at And then you also, so that's the cast. You have the wonderful score by John Corgiolano, which was nominated for an Oscar, but it lost. I don't think it deserved to lose. It's a very icon, very impressive score that combines all these different elements, all these different instruments into a very memorable and influential experience. I mean, just listening to the score itself gets makes your hair stand up on end. It, it the score itself can put you in a tri in a trance and on a psychedelic drug trip. I mean, that's how great this score is. The film wouldn't be nearly as powerful to me if it wasn't for Corgiolano's score. And I, it's a very, very underrated score. So the film came out, didn't do that much. It was a budget of $15 million. It made about $19.8 million. This is not counting the other millions of dollars that was spent on the other version of the film that fell through. And uh, so... It's a film that kind of, it's gotten a cult following. Critics do seem to like it, but I don't really hear very many people talk about it, though. Uh, especially nowadays. So the basic gist of the plot of Altered States is this. Edward Jessup is a university professor of abnormal psychology who, while studying schizophrenia, begins to think that our other states of consciousness are as real as our waking states, which is a very fascinating concept by itself. It's a film that definitely does grab you from the beginning with the hallucinations, the religious hallucinations with like a six-eyed goat and all these other, you know, hellish imagery. It's not a straight-up horror film, but there definitely are elements in it and sequences in it that are some of the most horrifying sequences I've ever seen. I mean, the six-eyed goats, the religious hallucinations, the hallucinations themselves, and the very concept of the film. The idea that you could de-evolve into nothing, or, you know, de-evolve into an ape-man, and then to nothing. I mean, just the idea of that kind of transformation is primal and terrifying. It's something that I, th I think it's a fear that we all have. And this film taps into that fear, that the fear of becoming literally nothing, of ceasing to exist as we know it, uh, de-evolving to primordial ooze is a very horrifying concept when you think about it. And this film does a great job of realizing that and showing that fear on screen. So anyway, he believes that uh, our other states of consciousness are as real as our waking states. So Jessup then begins experimenting with sensory deprivation and in, in using a flotation tank, uh, which is another really cool concept to see this idea of you know, the sensory deprivation tank. And uh, the, these tanks are they're still used today. And it's just one of those things where it, it separates your mind from your body. So your body pretty much becomes one with the water. And so you're basically just a brain floating in the water, like a brain floating in the jar, in a jar. So you're alone with your thoughts. So it then adds in this psychedelic drug into the mix and all hell breaks loose. So he's aided by two like-minded researchers, Parrish and Rosenberg. And at a faculty party, he meets fellow wonder kid, Emily and the two eventually marry and there's a little bit of chemistry there when they when they meet first meet each other but the film doesn't seem to focus that much on their romance or on their relationship they have some little bit of chemistry with one another she wants to marry him he's kind of reluctant about it and then you flash forward years in the future and they're already married they've already been married and they're getting ready to have a divorce and William Hurt is going to go off into Mexico to, you know, research, you know, this drug, you know, this uh, drug that these these uh, 
these, you know, these, uh, these tribesmen, these are, are, uh, this Mexican tribe is, is using. So it, it just feels pretty, uh, it definitely goes forward in time pretty quickly and it doesn't, you don't really get much in terms of why they, they were, they divorced and even his friends don't know that. It don't know it until like they overhear a housekeeper say that they're gonna get divorced. So even his friends, the scientist friends, confronts him as like, "Why are you getting divorced? I mean, you're perfect for each other. You're a perfect couple. I don't understand this, Eddie. I don't get it." And he's like, "Well, you know, things just didn't work out. Blah 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 blah." And it's just like, I I get it. I understand what they're trying to go for. They want to move the story along a little bit faster. I mean, the movie's only about 103 minutes, but I think he could have had that. Uh, fleshed out a little bit more because that makes the ending in the film so much more powerful it makes everything more powerful it makes everything that edward is going through more powerful and you understand what he's giving up you don't really get that feeling though you don't really get the feeling that oh he's giving up a woman that loves him and he's giving up his is you know his you know daughter his daughter is like an afterthought in this movie it, you don't really get that it's just Sci I understand he's a driven man. He's putting his science over love. I get it. They say that quite clearly when he's talking about why he's getting a divorce. But you don't see on screen, though, I, it just it just seems very, like, it's very distant. And I, I'm, I'm, I, that's a perfect word. I'm mean, used a lot, but that's how it, does, it feels. It's very distant, and it's hard to relate to William Hurt's character. Or to really care about what he's doing, or to really give a shit about his uh, his scientific experiments, or what he does to himself, because the relationship between him and his wife and his kid is so is so distant that I, I it's hard for me to relate. But what makes it worth it and what makes the journey the experience of watching alter states worth it and what makes it so great even though it's lacking that integral human element is the trippy as fuck visuals <laughs> so i mean it's definitely a case of i would definitely say it's a case of i'm trying to think of the it's a definite oh god damn it what is that fucking word style over substance it's definitely a case of style over substance, but it has such a unique style that it ends up working out. It's definitely a film you can't take your eyes off of, especially during these hallucination sequences. So then the film, like I said, skips ahead seven years. Eddie and Emily have two daughters. Okay, they have two daughters, not one. Okay, my bad. But it doesn't really... I didn't even know... this. It, it treats the kids as an afterthought. That's why I have a hard time remembering that he had one, let alone two. So he has two daughters, they're on the brink of divorce, they reunite with a couple who first introduce them, and when Edward hears of a Mexican tribe that experiences shared illusion states, he travels to Mexico to participate in what is apparently an Ahohuska ceremony. So during the walk into the bush, his guide states that the in indigenous tribe they're meeting works with Am Amanita Muscaria, which they're collecting for next year's ceremonies, which is uh, a mushroom. So an indigenous elder is then seen with a root in his hand prior to just cutting Jessup's hand, and he adds blood to the mixture he's preparing. And immediately after consuming this uh, this uh, drug, this concoction, he experiences bizarre, intense imagery. Like he's with his wife, and he's dressed up like some socialite, and there's like a snake that's wrapping around him. He sees like fireworks in the cave that he's in. He sees his a lizard, and then the lizard turns into, into his wife, who's still in the same position as the lizard, and she's naked. And then like there's this swirling uh, ash and dust that just covers everything. It covers his wife, who then turns solidifies into petrified stone, like. Pompeii, you know, like when the volcano erupted and you see and uh, there were citizens of Pompeii that were encased in ash. Well, you see this happen and it, it, it's just ash rolling around and, and covers his wife. She gets turned to stone. She then gets, uh, then 
she her features get blown away until there's nothing left but dust and more ash and he gets covered in ash and then he gets blown away and then everything is just a swirling giant storm of ash and dust and then he wakes up out of his, out of his trip and and then the guide is like saying you know you killed this lizard or something and he's like I don't remember killing a lizard you know it's like well you killed this lizard it was one hell of a trip and so he returns to the U.S. with this uh, with this mixture and he begins to study it. And he begins to take it orally before each session in the flotation tank because he thinks that will enhance the, uh, the trip where he experiences a series of increasingly bizarre and drastic psychological and physical transformations. And these are experiments to his mind. And the film basically is, is showing you what are the limitations of the, you know, kind of basically what are the limitations of the human mind? What? Is the human mind po possible? Like, what can the human mind create? Can it do the impossible? Can it change the physical body? And you see that in great detail with great special makeup effects by Dick Smith. Like, his arm bubbling and he turns into a ape man. And, and I know some people are thinking, like, that's the moment where the film goes off the rails. And I'm like, I'm, I'm fine with that. I think it's actually pretty... It, pretty cool and, and the ape man effects are great and and uh they had this gymnast guy play the ape man and definitely should show and and i i think it's still pretty it's i think sequences aren't ridiculous to me because i think it's pretty scary this is this is a, a human that de-evolved into this ape man because of some crazy drug that he took while he's in a sensory deprivation tank and uh, it just continues like he can't stop this from happening like he, he goes from the ape man and he he ends up de-evolving so he experiences actual physical biological de-evolution one stage he emerges from the isolation tank as a feral and uh light-skinned uh, primitive man the rest of the team becomes highly concerned about the experiments but edward is adamant about continuing it because he wants to find that truth. He wants to find what is true, what it, what is true in life and in consciousness. And the film definitely does get pretty deep when it comes to that. And he was very, very passionate about this early on in a very well-made, well-directed sequence where Patty, where where a director, Ken Russell decides to choose this sort of uncomfortable sort of vibe and feeling for this scene while he's drunk in a bar and he's called a wacko by his friend Charles Hayde. I can see why because he sounds like he's just off his rocker and so he's drunk and he's asserting he's talking about various methods of trying to find his true self and he already dismissed yoga he doesn't think that's how you do it. And he dismisses God because earlier in his life he was a very religious person and he had these religious hallucinations when he was younger uh, and these dreams. But then his father got sick and he just, something happened and he just refused to believe in God anymore. And so he's talking about the yoga practices and he's drunk here. And the way that this, this sequence is shot is very well done because it's very uncomfortable. It captures, it really shows the relationship between him and his and his, his wife starting to kind of uh, fracture here because you're starting to see him put his science and his his desire and his search for his white whale, which is the truth, which is the self, uh, end up swallowing everything else in his life. So he talks about these yoga practices. So he's like, what dignifies the yogic practices is that the belief system is not only truly religious, there is no Buddhist God per se. It is the self, the individual mind that contains immortality and ultimate truth. At least I know where the self is. It's in our own minds as a form of human energy. Our atoms are six billion years old. We've got six billion years of memory in our minds. Memory is energy. It doesn't disappear. It's still in there. There's a physiological pathway to our earlier consciousness. There has to be. And I'm telling you, it's in the goddamn limbic system. I'm a man in search of his true self. How archetypically American can you get? 
Everybody's looking for their true selves. We're trying to fulfill ourselves, understand ourselves, get in touch with ourselves, face the reality of ourselves, explore ourselves, expand ourselves. Ever since we dispense with God, we've got nothing but ourselves to explain this meaningless horror of life. Well, I think that that true self, the original self, that original self, that first self, is real. It's a real, menstruate, quantifiable thing. Tangible and incarnate. And I'm gonna find the fucker. So, that's his whole goal. That's what he's trying to do. That's why he takes these drugs. That's why he goes into the sensory deprivation tank. That's why he starts changing his body and his mind. Because he's trying to find the self. And so his friends are concerned, but he's adamant about continuing it because he's experiencing these changes in, in, the, in, in his mind and his body that are, that are amazing, that, are, that have never been seen before, that are every scientist's wet dream in a way. But it becomes an addiction and it cannot stop. And it ultimately ends up destroying him. So in a subsequent experiment, though, he is then regressed into an amorphous mass of conscious primor primordial matter. And this is, the, this is the moment where he ends up proving to his wife, and, to, and his wife already was starting to believe him, because originally she was thinking he was crazy when he's talking about all this stuff that was happening to him. But then she listened to the tapes that he recorded, and then really, and then she realized that the sound that he was making from his from his vocal cords was primitive, was the sound of an ape, a baboon. She was like, there's something go wrong here. He really is changing his body. We need to do something about this. And of course, hey, you know, his other friends, he gets this bunch of bullshit. And so he gets in the tank one last time and his scientist friends are there and he's in there for a long time. So they think nothing's going to happen. And then bam! There's a freaking psychedelic light show, and then he becomes primordial ooze, this massive primordial ooze that's just swirling around in a circle like a black hole. And this is all practical, folks. This is in 1980, so it's all practical. And so, and it's I'm such a sight to see. It's kind of stunning this didn't win an Oscar for Best Visual Effects. I don't know why it lost. I think it lost to Empire Strikes Back. No offense to Empire Strikes Back, but what this film was doing was things that I think were uh, definitely a little bit harder to do in terms of you know the stuff that Star Wars Empire Strikes Back was doing. But I still don't have no problem with Empire winning. But Altered States, I think, was at least nominated, so that's something. But I don't, I don't even know... Yeah, it was at least nominated. I think it was definitely at least nominated for, for that. Actually, no, it wasn't. It was never nominated for Best Visual Effects. Which, what? I cannot believe that. It was never nominated. It was nominated for sound and score. But never nominated for visual effects, which is stunning to me. I can, I, it's, I don't know why. I mean, it created a primordial, you know, a whirlpool. I, it created all these different kind of stuff that I have never seen before in a film. I, I, I don't know why that was not nominated, um, but okay. But anyway, so this happens, and he's this mash of consciousness, and Emily uh, intervenes, and she's the one thing that brings him back from the brink, brings him back uh, from basically nothing. And then he tries to control it and he basically admits in a great scene where he's talking to Emily and he's telling her what happened and he ends up basically telling her how he felt and this is an excellent sequence and Sidney Aaron is is a pseudonym that Patty Chavesky used so he's his name is still in the film but it's a pseudonym he took his name off the movie, but he still wrote the screenplay. So Jessup is, he admits to his wife that he found no final truth in his experimental search for the self with hallucinogenic drugs and the sensory deprivation tank. And this is, this is pretty much what he says. I can't tell you how much you mean to me. How much I need you and the kids. 
I just wanted you to know that. You saved me. You redeemed me from the pits. I was in it, Emily. I was in that ultimate moment of terror that is the beginning of life. It is nothing. Simple, hideous nothing. The final truth of all things is that there is no final truth. Truth is what's transitory. It's human life that is real. I don't want to frighten you, Emily. What I'm trying to tell you is that the moment of terror is real. It's a moment of terror that is a real and living terror and a living horror living and growing within me now. And the only thing that keeps it from devouring me is you. And then she's talking to him. She says, why can't you just come back to us? And he's like, it's too late. I don't think I can get out of it anymore. I can't live with it. The pain is too great. And then that's when you have the final uh, crazy trip where he uh, more, he de-evolves again into that blob-like thing. And he's smashing himself against the wall. And it's something that, of course, you know, the music video by AHA, Take On Me, would uh, reference. And even, you know, uh, South Park has referenced before. It's a very iconic sequence with great makeup effects by Dick Smith. And he's pounding against the wall, fighting against this this uh, part of him that he's unleashed. And he even ends up devolving his, his wife, too. She's trying to help him. She gets turned into something else. Like, she... She's like, uh, her body is cracked, and she's, uh, looks like she's made out of lava, and eventually, though, he does fight it, and he gets rid of that part of himself, and he reunites with his wife, and brings her back, and they, re they reunite with each other, uh, both naked, uh, with basically a newfound appreciation for their own humanity, and they embrace, and that's the end of the film. That's all of their states. It's an ending that, for the longest time, like I, when I was, when every time I saw this, I loved the visuals and I loved the score. And Russell's direction was good. It was dynamic and and very, very visually appealing. But I was always like, man, I don't know about that ending. And it's, I still kind of feel that way. I think it. it I, I like the freak out scene at the end, but it's just one of those things that's it's kind of convenient. It's kind of a convenient Hollywood ending where, oh, he manages to beat it. When this is something that I think if you unleash this part of yourself and, and made that connection, I don't think it's something that you're just going to beat by human willpower. It just seems kind of convenient. And in a way, I think the story would definitely be more effective if he didn't. And it's one of those it's one of those stories that kind of does call for maybe unha an unhappy ending where he can't fight it. it. He just he just stays the, the primordial whatever, you know, ooze and then the, then dissipates into nothing. And this is this is the effect of going too far with scientific research and trying to play God. But no, we have the happy ending, which at one part I like it, the other part I'm kind of like, I don't know. I don't know if that really works with this movie. Um, and a part of it is because, like what I was mentioning, I don't really feel the connection between him and his wife. And I don't feel the, you saved me, uh, you know, and the kids. And I'm like, I don't really feel that because we rarely see that many scenes with him and his kids. We see like one scene before the divorce. You know, before he heads off to Mexico, where he's he's holding on to the kid. But that's about it. We don't really see him have fun with the kids. We don't see him, you know, take the kids to the park. We don't see them bond. We don't see him bond with his wife that much. Uh, they've been together for seven years? Because that's supposed to be the case. Like, seven years later, that's when he goes to Mexico. And then gets the drug. And then starts this downward spiral. And I'm like, we don't really see a lot of the good times that he had with his wife and his kids. So then when he says, like, you saved me, just... It's a great scene, and William Hurt does a great job delivering those lines, and I love the whole moment where he says, you know, I was in it, Emily. It was in that ultimate moment of terror, you know, that is the beginning of life. And, but it it lacks something. It lacks a heart. And I think that's one of the things that 
that ultimately holds back the film is that it it lacks a heart. It doesn't have that human element that would have taken it over the top and would have made that that ending work because you don't because you don't have that human element and you don't feel that passion for those these characters. So when they do when he does get out of it, when he does battle against himself and wins, it doesn't really it's not very cathartic. It's not a very cathartic feeling. So you're basically left with a movie where you just remember it more for the crazy trippy visuals and and a few lines of dialogue and a great performance by William Hurt and a crazy score, some good direction and some great effects work more than anything else. But damn, there's just some great visuals and there's some great effects work and they go a long way for me. And yeah, I, the film, I can't say is perfect. But I still think it's underrated. I still think it's overlooked because it's so visually impressive. It's such an interesting, fascinating concept. And it's a movie that I think does a great job showing this inner battle, this battle for the self that we all have. And uh, does it in a way that is, is very visually pleasing to the human eye. And it's also a, an effective horror film in a lot of ways. But... Um, I really don't know what else to say about Altered States, except if it was a rated of five stars, I give the movie four, four out of five. I wanted to give this a more in-depth review than I did the last time, because I honestly feel it deserves it. The one thing, just the, I love everything else about the movie, except for the lack of humanity, the lack of a heart. It doesn't have that human heart beating within it that would end up really making uh, it a very cathartic experience which is what they're trying to go for at the end but i don't really get it because i don't feel that human element uh like i do with something like the fly and the fly ends with a or with a definitely a more tragic ending than this movie does but it definitely earned it and um yeah i don't know what to say so thank you for watching and i will see you guys later see ya